John 3, starting in verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. Again, we ask that he would write these eternal truths on each of our hearts this morning. As you can tell probably from the outline, this is a sermon today on biblical repentance. Uh, if you don't know already, this is not a popular subject. Uh, this is not one that's going to pack them in here. This is not a sermon, I don't believe, that really anybody really wants to hear. But nevertheless, it is one that we need to hear each one of us. And I think, uh, for sure, this is a topic, this is a subject that is so absolutely vital and necessary in our understanding of what Christianity is, what we are to be through the merits of Christ Jesus. And it's something that we are called to do, first of all, with God as repentance but also of each other as we continue to sin against one another. And so the first thing to do is to try to understand, I think, a little bit better what uh, we mean by repentance and looking to the scriptures to help us uh, understand it a little bit better. It's a... uh, Biblical concept, obviously, we see it here in Jonah 3. This is the New Testament as well. And there's actually a a, a lengthy section I want to read from Acts chapter 8, verse 9, that speaks about what biblical repentance truly is. And also is not. There was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed. He was amazed. Now, I want to pause right there for just a second before reading the second half of this passage and say that I think one of the greatest challenges that that a lot of us have is how do we know, and how do you know if somebody comes to you and uh, repents, if they're truly repentant? Nobody wants to be duped. Nobody wants to uh, be fooled or be made a fool of by somebody that maybe says they're repentant, but ultimately is is not. So the question for us is, is how do how do we know? Well, let's go on and and, uh, let me just read the second section. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to him them. Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, 
but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I may uh, lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And I pull this section out of Acts because here is an example. Somebody in the church, he had been baptized for crying out loud. Right? I mean, that's good enough proof, isn't it, for, for a lot of people? You wouldn't believe, actually, the, 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 the number of people that call here uh, asking if I'll baptize their kids. Uh, I, I don't know these people from Adam and they, because I think, they think, well, this is a sure sign. Um, uh, it's not a sure sign. This is a, an example here, I think, in, in Acts chapter 8, that Simon didn't so much believe God, but, but believed Philip. I mean, this is a big problem too in the church today. Don't just take my word for things that I say up here. I, I want you to believe what God says. And go back to the scriptures and continue to look and plumb the depths of those for your answers. One of the first things we see that biblical repentance is, is that it is a mourning over sin. Uh, and just this past week, uh, we lost two very close friends of ours uh, in a, pre a previous church. Uh, one to a uh, brain tumor that came on uh, less than a month ago, and now he's gone. Uh, another dear lady of a heart attack just uh, uh, Thursday. And so uh, it's a reminder. And as we have talked to family members, you realize what mourning is. It's more than just sadness. It's something that goes far deeper than that, that touches the very recesses of our hearts. And we're called here, as we repent, to not just cry over our sins, but to mourn over it. What does that look like? But we see here, to go back to this Jonah text here, that, that we see the king of all people, the king of Nineveh, he arises from his throne, he removes his robe, and I'm sure it was quite a stunning-looking robe. And he puts on sackcloth and ashes. That's the first way we see them uh, repenting. Sackcloth, it would have been some kind of burlap material. Ashes uh, lying in the dust. I mean, it may not sound like much, but I mean, can you imagine... And I think really the, the greatest example that we all know of a king would be uh, King Charles. If you saw, you're scrolling through your social media feed and you see the little uh, reel that somebody's put up of King Charles taking off his royal gowns and draping himself in a burlap sack and then writhing on the ground and dust. I mean, you would think he had lost his mind. And so this is, this is sort of what, what this act is. That when we read, and you read it quite frequently, especially in the Old Testament, of sackcloth and ashes, uh, this is the posture of someone mourning. Someone has, that has sort of come to their wit's end. I think that's a good way of describing it. To mourn over their sin. We also note that they call for a fast 
uh, to give up uh, eating and drinking for a period of time to help them uh, corporately uh, focus their attention better, to uh, go to the Lord in prayer for longer periods of time. This is what mourning over sin looks like. We read last week in 2 Corinthians 7, for even if, I'm, if I made you grieve with my letter, Paul's talking about his first letter to the Corinthians, which was quite harsh, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that there, that, uh, that, that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but, you were, but because you were grieved into what? Repenting. For you felt a godly grief, that's mourning over sin, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief, Paul says, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what Punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. The Corinthian church was grieved. They were mourning over their sin. This is where repentance begins. But it's not just simply that. Also notice there's a turning from their sins. These Ninevites, uh, verse 8, interestingly enough, the sackcloth and ashes goes not just on every human, but upon every beast as well. Verse 8, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. And that's exactly what they did. There was a, 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 an art exhibit of Assyrian art uh, from, uh, I think it was about the 8th century uh, BC through the 6th century BC, which is exactly this time period, more towards the, the 700s, um, that uh, went up in 2018 in the British Museum in London. And the Guardian, uh, the British newspaper, uh, commenting on this exhibit of Assyrian art, uh, that's who the Ninevites were, this is the kingdom of Assyria, uh, wrote this after uh, walking through, looking at these various pieces of art from this time period. He said, you have to hand it to the ancient Assyrians, they were honest. Their artistic propaganda relishes every detail of torture, massacre, battlefield executions, and human displacement that made Assyria the dominant power of the Middle East from about 900 to 612 BC. Assyrian art contains some of the most appalling images ever created. In one scene, tongues are being ripped from uh, their mouth, the mouths of prisoners that will mute their screams when in the next stage of their torture they are flayed alive. In another relief, a surrendering general is about to be beheaded, and in a third, prisoners have to grind their father's bones to eat before being executed in the streets of Nineveh. You see how violent uh, this people group was? Uh, it was well known uh, in the ancient world, certainly. And yet we are told here that they turned from their evil and violent ways. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence in his hands. He says that's what repentance is also. It's a mourning over your sin, but it's also a turning from your sin. It's not merely regretting your sin or feeling bad about it, but it's, it's a complete abandonment of it. And so you see, this is why we cannot embrace 
certain ideologies, certain teachings that say, well, yeah, you can hang on to this and identify with this particular sin, but still call yourself a Christian. You see how that is in direct conflict with, with the very least with John 3, 8, and I would contend with other portions of Scripture as well, but large portions of Scripture. But we're not just called to feel bad about it. We're called to mourn about our sin. We're called then to turn away from it. We no longer allow it in our lives. We do whatever it takes to be free from it. And yes, sin dies a very long and slow death oftentimes. I know. But nevertheless, I want you to see here that you are called to turn away completely abandoning your sin. That's why the church and fellowship of the saints is such an important thing, something that we uh, really want to uh, try to emphasize here this fall at a uh, good shepherd to place uh, each family unit in the church in a uh, shepherding group where we can gather at least once a month. You'll see these assignments coming out uh, next week as we finalize that. But it's a way that we can gather together. We can continue to study God's word together. We can pray with each other. We can get to know each other a little bit better. Become familiar with our struggles, each other's pain, each other's anxieties. This is how we grow into a, a stronger community of faith. And I think we're pretty strong. We're showing signs of it, certainly. And then thirdly, biblical repentance is turning to God in renewed faith. There's a tendency today for Christians to assume that repentance is experienced before faith and leads to faith. But uh, this view, I think, is a, a, a bit of a misunderstanding. It tends to confuse conviction of sin with conversion, mourning for sin with turning away from sin, which, as we have just seen, is a hallmark of repentance. Furthermore, the real repentance which brings life accompanies faith rather than causes it. I mean, do you see what I'm trying to get at here? It's a, a small nuance, but it's very, very important. Biblical repentance, which brings life, accompanies faith. It doesn't cause it. As though we just had to repent way back when in our conversion, and then not give too much concern to it. I, I, mean, I think this is rampant in a lot of churches today. Now, your call to repent is a lifelong call. Your sin doesn't end. You don't just stop sinning once you give your life over to Jesus Christ. We continue to wrestle. We continue to struggle. And so the life of a Christian is one of repentance. And the penitence, the repentance of the Ninevites here expresses this, what I would call a mustard seed of faith. Look at verse 9. I mean, if you were to listen to this profession of faith, would you say it's genuine? Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. I'll tell you right now what my answer would be is yes. I think this shows true repentance, but it, 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 and it shows true faith as well. It, it, it's a small faith. It's a newborn faith, certainly. It's not a mature faith or, or even maybe a strong faith. It doesn't have full assurance. It barely has any assurance. But it's faith nonetheless. Maybe God will turn and relent from his fierce anger. So that's our first point, what biblical repentance is. 
I'm going to go back and, and much more quickly go through how it works. Because I think that's here in this text as well and, and so very helpful. First of all, it takes the illumination of the Word of God. Second Corinthians, we go back there again, verses 4, or excuse me, chapter 4, verses 3 and following. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But you see what the Word of God does. It shows to us, it reveals to us our great need. It, it, it beckons us to cry out that I cannot do this. Nothing that I have done will ever make up for or relieve the burden of guilt. This mourning will not end over my sin unless, Lord God, you move mightily. You see, I think this is where sort of the rubber meets the road for most in our society today. We'll call them the, the modern man. It really, I think, comes down to something very simple, the simple fact that we don't want to ask for help. We don't want to uh, admit that we need help. There's too much pride there. In fact, this is, uh, I think, in a lot of non-Christian people let it know, this is the worst thing imaginable. We would confess that we can't do it ourselves, that somebody else has to do it for us. It's unthinkable. It's weak. It's pathetic. And so the modern man, I think, downplays his sin quite a bit, downplays his needs changes the subject or just simply tries to medicate a problem away. But when the Word of God takes hold and illumines the human heart to its great need, it then points it to the mercy and the grace of God. Where do we see the mercy of God here? Well, it's certainly implied and Jonah's calling them to repent. If you receive a shut-off notice from NIPSCO that uh, in 30 days they're going to shut off your power for lack of payment, do you see the implication there? It means you haven't paid your gas bill or your electric bill. I'm calling them to repent. You see what Jonah's doing is implied there very strongly they've got a righteousness problem but it's also the mercy of God that showed forth in Jonah's life too is it not so Jesus understands it in Luke 11 we're told that Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh but here, Jonah, in a lot of ways, we could say he got swallowed up by a whale. He got exactly what he deserved. But in God's infinite mercy, he did not allow him to receive all that he deserved. He spared his life by causing this great fish to vomit him out on the land. He gave him life. And so the Ninevites, through Jonah's preaching, are pointed back again to the life that they have in this God of Jonah's name, repent. You also notice that they get what they don't deserve, which is life, freedom from sin. And mourning is turned to rejoicing as they see that God provides what they never could, a righteousness, not their own. 
look at Matthew's teaching on uh, the, the Luke 11 passage, you know, the, the gospel writers oftentimes will focus on slightly this different uh, aspects of the same material. In Matthew 12, 40, we read that Jesus says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So in Jonah's preaching, we see foreshadowed, and in Jonah himself, we see foreshadowed the greater Jonah, one who went down into the belly of death, only received what he did not deserve, so that he might give to us through his resurrection what we don't deserve, which is the grace of God being spared from sin. And I tell you now, there is no other way to salvation except through faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done in his life and death and resurrection. We're called to turn and repent. We're called to turn and face Jesus. Embrace him with open arms and claim this righteousness that is not ours. And yes, oh yes, it shows our great need but it shows the great, even greater grace of God to us in doing all this that we could not. And then finally, I want to point your attention again to verse 9, and we'll get to 10 as well, but uh, in my Bible there's a little footnote on verse 9, who knows? God may turn and relent. That's the footnote. In some translations like to render this uh, Hebrew verb as repent. As though God has repented. And so I think it's important to at least touch on this. But first of all, I want you to see from this before we get into the details of it. Just see in verses 9 and 10, we'll read 10 here in a second, but I want you to notice what God desires to see. Verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster uh, that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Notice what it doesn't say, first of all. It doesn't say that God saw they're all in their sackcloth and ashes. It doesn't say that God saw that they had fasted. It doesn't say that God saw that they had sacrificed. It just simply says that God sees that their hearts turned away from sin. God saw their compassion and their repentance. That their hearts were mourning that they had turned from their sin, that they, had, that they were repentant. This is what God desires most of all from us, that we would repent, that we would turn from our sin, and that we would turn unto him with renewed faith. Now back to the question of God's repenting here. What does that mean exactly? Well, I think one commentator really kind of shuts the door on any question of God actually <coughs> repenting of wrongdoing. He says, This has led some to question the omniscience of God, as if he had previously judged them in error, or of the immutability of God, that is, his changelessness, since he appears to have changed his mind. You see, these two attributes of God is omniscience, right? knowing all things and doing all things according to his will and his changelessness, right? God cannot change. It's not what he's getting at here, and that's not what the translators even mean that would render 
this verb relent, to repent. You see, if we look at God's word and understand it better, his word uh, accommodates to our understanding. God accommodates his word to our understanding. And so when we see things, the, the technical term for it is an anthropomorphism. It's easier to just say that God uh, is sometimes described in human terms that we might understand a little bit better when you read about the hand of God. It doesn't mean that God has, you know, uh, two hands with ten fingers on them. Or God speaks from the mouth of God, you know, expressions like this, the ears of God. It's a way of helping us understand a little bit better. It's a metaphor of sorts when we read that God repented. Another commentator says this, when God is said to change his mind, matters are viewed from our human perspective. It appears to us that there has been a change in God, but what has in fact changed is our human conduct. And so it's precisely here as we close. It is precisely because God is unchanging that we are encouraged here to repent. Don't miss the uh, deeper meaning of this verse, these two verses. God is unfailing in both his wrath against sin, that's the first way we see that he is unchanging, and his mercy toward faithful repentance. These two things, there is no variation in God's opposition to wickedness. Therefore, we are always called to repent of our sin. And there is no variation in his delight in receiving sinners who call on the name of the Lord and lay hold of his mercy through faith in his word. These two truths about God come to a head here. We see that. And this is largely setting up for next week and jumping the anger towards God. But we'll ask the question before next week that Jonah's asking. I mean, this place is this. How can God forgive such a city as Nineveh? How can God forgive a people that would skin someone alive? Force someone to grind their parents' bones in the dust before their head is brutally chopped off as well. How could God fail to look past so many of these people's sins? How could God relent in bringing judgment upon such blatant bloodshed? How can God not avenge the hundreds of thousands of Assyria's enemies, that they have wronged, that Nineveh's king has wronged them. I think these are all valid questions, but before we ask them, I think we need, and we're called actually by Scripture, to ask them of ourselves. All these same questions we would ask of Assyria and Nineveh, we could certainly ask of ourselves and should. How could God really forgive the things that I've done in my life? How can he just look past the countless sins, the blasphemies that I've uttered with my mouth and my tongue? How can God just forgive the injuries that I've caused other people? The pain that, that my senseless sinful heart and mind have inflicted upon others? And the answer is found actually in a, a fairly unusual place here in this text. It's found in the Hebrew words of all places that are used here. The word describing uh, Nineveh's repentance uh, Shubah, 
chose that and signifies a turning from evil to good. We, we saw that already, that they have turned from their evil ways, they have uh, turned away from their sin, abandoned it. But the word here is becoming one of my favorite words. God relents is the word naham in the Hebrew. And it's the word that describes God's repentance. And it's quite simply translated as moved to pity. It's a type of suffering. So the answer to all these questions, how can Nineveh be forgiven? How can I be forgiven? The answer to how we can be forgiven and in turn, in turn forgive others is that God suffers in relenting from judgment by taking that very judgment upon himself and watching his very own son die under that judgment. Your judgment. My judgment. Nineveh's judgment all comes to a head on the cross that Jesus died upon. God takes all that evil, all that sin, to all that turn to him, and pours it upon Jesus, so that God might justly, quote, repent of his holy obligation to condemn us, all because of the merciful grace that he calls us to believe. He calls us to repent. And so looking at that cross now, we see its necessity. We see there is no other way to be at peace with God but through faith in Jesus Christ. And seeing that cross and seeing Jesus bear your sin so that you didn't have to face the judgment of God let that warm your heart today. Let that work even greater repentance in your life. Let that move you to more and more deliberately turn away from your sin, to abandon it all together, and to seek after Him and to live your life for Him. Brothers and sisters, there's no other way. No other way to be happy no other way to be blessed in this life but through repentance of sin that only comes through the cross of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, you've been so good to us. We thank you and praise you for your mercy and for your grace. And we would ask now you uh, would continue to work repentance in our 